Today is February 1, 2022. This is Ben Repond. I'm going to share with you my um, insights on the economy and the stock market. First, I wanted to let you know that uh, we've switched over to the YouTube format, which I'm very delighted with. This will be my second broadcast. Uh, I've decided I'm going to do this every other week, which I have been doing for almost two years now. And the alternating week, I'm going to also do a shortened broadcast on the stock market. So I will have one every Tuesday, hopefully every Tuesday. Um, one will be a shortened version, perhaps around 15 minutes, just on the stock market. So that there's kind of, it's more dynamic and there's um, updates uh, that uh, could happen more frequently. And then this longer version, which will be like today, on the alternating weeks. Uh, I do not accept ads, so you won't have any ads that interrupt this. Um, but it does help me if you subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. And if you like it, click the like button and uh, then share it if you want to share it. There is a section below for comments. If you type in comments or questions, I will respond to all of them. And um, I think that's it. We'll get started. As I go through this, I'll first cover the economy, uh, economic indicators, and then uh, we will get into the Fed and then into the stock market, uh, Fed and inflation and the stock market. And when I get into the stock market, I just want to point this out so I don't forget, is that the uh, stock market and the economy, I'm going to show both, but they are usually very non-correlated. The stock market can go one way, the economy can go another, and vice versa. Occasionally, they are correlated and move together. But if you follow economic news or watch TV, uh, you will see certain things relative to the economy. And I just want you to know, don't necessarily connect those to the stock market because they sometimes won't make sense. Okay, I'm going to jump into, um, this is a survey, which is a perception by employers about what their concerns are as an employer. The first labor shortages, labor costs and shortages. You know this because how many times do you encounter um, uh, a company and they don't have enough people? They're looking for people. Uh, they're short. You, so you end up with longer lines, longer waits. Uh, they will sometimes tell you, um, we're looking for people and we can't find them. They're either, they, they do need sometimes to be either qualified or able to be trained to become qualified. Uh, secondly, COVID impact. That encompasses a lot of things related to COVID. Uh, the others all relate to supply chain issues, supply chain disruptions, transportation, and raw materials. So those are the concerns of major employers and you could lump those into two or three broader categories. <clears throat> Mike Rowe said, that there are 4.5 million people, according to a survey, and he's just quoting the survey, quitting their jobs. This will impact every single American. So if you think about right now, the, the amount of shortages there are, according to the survey, people are saying, and they've figured out that there's about 4.5 million people this year, 2022, who plan to quit their jobs. When you go back a year ago, pre-pandemic, January, February uh, 2020, uh, there were about 151 million people in the uh, labor force. Today, that's 148 million. So 3 million people have already dropped out. Now, that could be for a variety of reasons. Death, they have COVID or fear of having COVID. Um, and people don't want to work for some reason. Uh, and uh, I don't know where that 3 million people went. I don't think all of that is related to COVID and death. Um, 
So there was some slippage in there, but we're three million people short in the U.S. labor market. And according to this survey, which he's quoting, another four and a half million are going to quit their plan to quit their jobs. So whatever tightness we experience in the labor market, expect that to get tighter. Pending home sales slump as the housing supply dwindles, leaving buyers with very few options. So what's happening is um, housing is, uh, is um, the cost of housing is going up because there's less and less inventory. And I don't know that there's more buyers, but if there's the same amount of buyers with fewer, uh, with fewer buyers, uh, uh, fewer, there's uh, fewer houses, same fewer houses with the same buyers, uh, it, it's, causing a, uh, it's causing prices to go up and a tightness in the labor market. <clears throat> this is a chart that shows the um, uh, active listings on housing inventory going back uh, during 2021. So you can see relative to previous years, the four previous years, you can see how low the inventory is. You know that through uh, people that you talk to or stories that you hear. This is a price housing price index. The red line is the nominal or the uh, numerical uh, number of the cost of housing. The blue line is the real cost of housing. So the blue line has been adjusted for inflation. Either way, prices are up. Even relative to inflation, prices are still up. The initial jobless claims uh, is reported. This shows a 10-year period of time. You can see the red line goes way up above the screen and then comes down. Uh, the black line uh, comes down uh, to the very bottom. That was last year. And then the dark blue line on the left, which I've indicated with an arrow, is uh, January of 2022. So you can see that the jobless claims are continuing to drop. What that means to me is that uh, someone who wants a job uh, can get it. And there are you know, job openings everywhere. If someone is reasonably qualified or willing to be trained uh, for that job. We have seen since March of 2020, the uh, economy uh, continue to grow, uh, measured by gross domestic product, GDP. As we get to uh, the current month, January, we have seen a drop, a dramatic drop from 4.3, 4, 4.5% all the way down to 2.8. That may not sound like a lot, but you can see on this chart how significant it is, a big drop in gross domestic product. So um, this is the um, uh, forecast going forward. So uh, why has um, January been hit so hard in the stock market? Two or three reasons, this is probably one of them. So are we headed into a steeper decline? We don't know. But if the, the uh, gross domestic product happens to be somewhere in that 2.8 range, it will slow not only the economy, but it will have an impact on the stock market, in my opinion. <clears throat> the, this measures a three-week period of time from the end of December through the 21st of January, three calendar weeks. Uh, the market was down substantially for the month of January. We'll get into that later. How where was that broken down? We did every sector collapse? No. The two bars on the far left are consumer discretionary and technology. On the far right, indicated by the red arrow, is energy. Energy was the one sector in the economy that did very well 
And of course, we know that because of the price we pay for fuel and energy related products. Everything else was in between and was down. But overall, the net effect, it was all down. When you look at uh, commodities, uh, which includes energy, um, here's how that breaks down into the types of commodities and the rate of return that those commodities are getting uh, in the market. Measured the top five, nickel, Brent crude, iron ore, gasoline, and aluminum. So those are the ones that are um, growing the fastest and impacting uh, the line going up. Morgan Stanley's commodities chief sees oil prices hitting $100 per barrel this year. That is not a big stretch. Oil prices are now about $90 per barrel. So that is approximately a 10% increase in the price of uh, oil. Uh, that, <laughs> I don't know that that should make headlines. The, uh, what concerns me, and this is just a question mark, is, is oil going to go higher or much higher than $100? When we see some of the issues, I'll talk about them later, uh, that could definitely affect that to go even higher. I don't know that we'll hit $150 a barrel, uh, but it could go much higher than $100 if some of the issues play out that are in play right now, and that won't be good for uh, the market for sure. Now I'm gonna jump over to inflation and the Fed. Uh, the Fed is, Federal Reserve Bank is a bank of banks. It is owned by its member banks. So it's private, it is not government, even though it has the word federal in it and the, the Federal Reserve Chairman has to be approved by Congress, it is a bank. It's a bank of banks, so uh, it's private. And they are in charge of doing several things, but one of them is the printing of money. Now today, they do print money to replace money that goes out of circulation, but most of the money that comes into circulation is digital. You can see from 2007, the straight line going to the upper right of the chart is pretty straight. It goes up until the pandemic, which is marked by that gray vertical line. When the pandemic hit, right at the end of March, they started printing huge printing, putting into circulation huge amounts of money, digital money, trillions of dollars. So you can see even counting the 2008 crisis, how much more money has been put in circulation. We are now approaching 22 trillion. So when you see the last almost two years, look at how much, and it's still increasing. Look at how much money is going into circulation. What is the effect of that inflation? More dollars in the economy means each dollar is worth less, which means the cost of goods is higher and higher, even though incomes do not match that. So um, the printing of money at this level is highly inflationary. So this article, it's a Forbes article, uh, and this, these are predictions. This is not fact. This is uh, opinion uh, predictions for 2022. It caught my eye. Inflation hits 15%. I'll show you in a minute. Fossil fuels boom. We've already just talked about that. And a hypersonic Cold War starts between U.S. and Russia, U.S. and China, etc. Uh, here are the predictions for 2022, and they go on to list what those are. What caught my eye was inflation hits 15%. Do you know the number they're working from? You've seen this chart before, if you followed me. This comes off of shadowstats.com which tracks, uh, that site tracks the uh, real rate of inflation relative to the published rate. The published rate subtracts several things, um, uh, energy, food, 
and then a substitution component, which is discretionary. They can substitute any item of a higher price for an item of a lower price in, or, in, other, in order to bring the, the index down. And this is not an inflation index, it's consumer price index, but it is used to be an indicator for inflation. So when you look at the red line, that's the line that they're talking about in the Forbes article. They're talking about that line, which is now at about 7%, going to 15. That's not the real rate of inflation. So if the real rate of inflation is the blue line, which I believe it is, because it, you add back the items that were subtracted, then inflation, instead of being 15%, that differential is about 8%. So that would take inflation to, on a real basis, to 23%, about 23%. Wow, that is starting to move into hyperinflation, in my opinion. And this is talking about this year, 2022. Now, we're not saying, I'm not saying, and the article is not saying that it's 23, or it's gonna hit 23, or it's even gonna hit 15, but it is a prediction. And they're looking at the cost of energy and the other things that we've talked about, housing, et cetera. This is an article that, uh, I don't know if you follow the Mises Institute. Um, it's a think tank. And they um, wrote this article on their blog recently and it caught my eye. It says, why fighting inflation is not a priority for the Fed. Now, back up. What is the priority for the Fed? It should be monetary policy. The um, uh, printing of money or putting money in circulation, adjusting interest rates, and creating stability in the banking system. Those are the primary goals since 1913, when it was f formed, uh, of the Federal Reserve. The article talks about uh, that there are two governors that it, they quote, uh, on the Federal Reserve Board who are wanting that the priority of the Fed to be dealing with racial inequality and climate change. Now, I don't want to get into the politics of those, those are political and social issues. Uh, that should be the uh, uh, area focused on by the administration and Congress not the Federal Reserve Board, which is a bank of banks. And so they are influ they want the Fed to influence policy to um, affect outcomes in climate change and racial inequality. I've never heard of anything like that. I'm not saying I'm against it or for it. I mean, racial, in racial equality uh, seems like a good thing. I would want that. Uh, having climate stability, I'd probably want that. But uh, you get into policy issues around that, and uh, that it's curious to me that the Fed would step into that area. But the Fed has become more of a political um, arm and uh, is doing things that are more in politics than in the banking system and in the monetary policy. Okay, we're going to jump over into the stock market, and this is a dashboard that I uh, put together uh, off of software that I use, and it, uh, as of this morning, uh, there are, this has been, by the way, for the some time now, the past week or two, has been solid red. So now we're starting to see some uh, indexes that are going more, a little more uh, favorable. But this measures, I'll go down the list, there are six of them going down on the left side. Uh, SPY, which is the S&P 500. QQQ, which is um, the NASDAQ 100. DIA, the Dow Industrial Average. IWM, which is the uh, Russell 2000 uh, small cap index, uh, the smallest 2000 companies on the stock exchange. Uh, EFA, which is the uh, developed countries, foreign markets and EEM, which is the emerging foreign markets. So six different uh, types of indexes. This gives a good broad spectrum uh, internationally of 
both in the U.S. and internationally, of what's going on with markets. And uh, measuring on the far right side four different moving averages. When it is red, that means that the um, uh, index is below that moving average. In other words, a bearish sign. Uh, a green dot means that it's above that line, starting to move in more favorable territory. In the last couple of days, past, last Friday and yesterday, Monday, uh, the market has moved up. And so with that, uh, that's why we're starting to see a little bit green appear, but everything is still remaining highly bearish and uh, confirmation has not yet happened that we are in fact in a bull market. We may be, but uh, the managers that I follow and all the major indicators are saying we need more confirmation before we make that assumption because many times what can happen is the market will go down and then it will kind of have a, what I call a relief rally, goes back up and then it falls back down again. Many times that happens. There are some times where when it hits the bottom, it just takes off and goes on up. I don't have the sense that we're in a bull market at this point. So that's why I would look at those and just be very cautious from an investor standpoint. This is through, through Friday. This is the 52-week uh, uh, weekly, each movement is, represents one week, movement of the S&P 500 represented by SPY, the tracking exchange-traded fund for the S&P 500. And you can see for that 52-week period, it stayed above the 20-period moving average. And then during the month of January, you can see that it dropped, clearly dropped below it, and now is well below it. And, you know, maybe there's a little bit of movement up on the end, but there is not confirmation that we're moving in the direction of a future sustained bull market. I would say this is bearish at this point. This is the S&P 500, represented by SPY, relative to the growth stock index. So compare the numerator, SPY, denominator, growth stock index. So the further this goes up, the more it favors the S&P 500 compared to growth stocks and vice versa. So you can see at the end that the S&P 500 is clearly above the 20 period moving average. And again, this is a weekly chart measured over one year, and the 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 uh, index has the ratio has gone very favorable to the S and P 500 compared to the uh, growth stock index. And this measures again another ratio, the S and P 500 spy relative to the small cap index. So small cap stocks over the past year, almost all of that time particularly the last, say, 10 months, nearly all of that time, the S&P 500 has outperformed small cap stocks. And you can see during the past three months, significantly outperformed small cap stocks. This is the uh, long-term government bond, put on a uh, moving average, 20 period moving average, um, one uh, chain, one amount of change represents one week, uh, the long-term government bond. So for the last two months, December and January mostly, the bonds have been coming down. You can see that on the right side of the chart where I put the red arrow. Why is that significant? Well, bonds, bond funds, in this case a bond fund, TLT, and I mean uh, high quality government AAA rated bond fund has been coming down and it is typically used by many advisors as a um, countermeasure, an antidote to stock risk. So that oftentimes we'll put stocks or stock indexes together with some form of bond or bond fund, usually government bonds like this. And this uh, shows that bonds have come down. 
And so they, during this period of time when bonds were needed to counteract stock risk, they're not there. Why? Interest rates are rising. We know that. Interest rates are going up, and that means that bonds and bond fund prices have to come down because the yield on bonds is correlated to interest rates. So uh, the traditional model of investing, you put stocks together with some bonds or bond funds, usually government bonds, um, did not work very well. That protection was not there. They did not move in a counter direction as was hoped for. So the traditional model of investing, uh, I'll say at this point, for that period of time, is not working. And that does not surprise me, and I've said that in the past, of why I think it's a model that uh, might have worked for the last 40 years, but uh, I don't see how it's going to work in the future with interest rates where they are. This is a measurement of the from Asbury uh, Research, and they use six indicators, uh, all of which are very different that measure, uh, you know, rate of change, asset flows, volume, breadth, etc. And when they believe they have uh, enough that these are more positive than negative, they will change the red or pink on the right to a green in the middle column and they indicate the date that they make that change. All six of these, as of this morning, are still negative, which is why I'm saying, uh, I'm not saying the market won't go up from here because it may, we don't know. But what I am saying is that we don't have confirmation of it. The market could go down and everything here is still indicating that it is bearish. This was about three years ago. So this is in 2018. So Alan Greenspan was a little bit ahead of his time when he made this statement. But he said, and he said correctly, there are bubbles in both stocks and bonds. How true did that happen? Or how much did he realize that he was forecasting the future? What has happened is that stocks have gone up, bonds have gone up. But that statement is more true today than it was the day he issued the statement. Now we're starting to see bonds break down. I won't say they're collapsing at this point, And we're seeing stocks break down. Um, because both of them, according to Alan Greenspan, are in a bubble. And I agree with him. This is a uh, chart from Asbury, which shows the and I highlighted on uh, the left the items which are green or favorable in all categories. So this compares, it's a, it's a comparison of uh, the top section relates to stocks or equities and the bottom section relates to bonds. So in equities, the question is, what is more favorable? High beta, high volatility in other words, versus low volatility stocks. In all categories, low volatility stocks are more favored than high volatility stocks measured on a weekly, monthly, or quarterly basis. Large cap or small cap? Large cap. We've seen the ratio on uh, small cap to the S&P, and the S&P, which is large cap, is in favor uh, for some time, most of this past year. So no surprise, large cap. Uh, S&P 500, which is the broad market. Yes, they're large cap, but it represents uh, all the sectors. Or the NASDAQ 100, technology stocks. In all cases, the S&P 500 is stronger during this time period than the growth stocks represented by the NASDAQ 100. The US, mar US or developed markets. The US is more favorable than developed markets. Uh, emerging markets is mixed. Um, and the uh, corporate or government bonds, government bonds, even though they're down, are more in favor than corporate bonds. This is a chart that shows the movement of money, of big money, into what countries or into the U.S.? During, this was uh, taken uh, 
the 21st of January, so this is about 10 days ago, um, and you can see this, <laughs> two or three months ago, this was almost all U.S., and now it has moved to, uh, money is moving to, as of the 21st of January, moving to a variety of other countries more than the U.S., and toward the end of last month, I'll say even last week, that began to change. And now the weekly view, and as well as the monthly and quarterly, the weekly view is now showing a surge of money coming back into the U.S. Isn't that interesting? How money flow can change week to week or month to month uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I won't get into those, what those could be. We really don't know, but I, I do have some theories on it. Um, but you can clearly see that money is favoring primarily the U.S. over foreign markets, at least in the short run. We'll see if that continues to, to develop, and it's starting to impact the monthly and quarterly view as well. One of um, our viewers uh, asked me to cover this, and I think it's a timely topic. One of the things, a couple of the things impacting the market, uh, one of them is the Russia-Ukraine issue, and uh, the other is the fear of uh, the Omicron uh, variant and um, the impact that that could have on the economy and on the market. Uh, the, so January was, I think, affected by uh, some combination of those two. Uh, as I read this article, this is from Reuters, as I read this article, um, they pointed out that uh, the if that that the likelihood of something uh, developing in Russia and Ukraine seems to be high at this point. Um, I don't want to get into that. That's a lot of speculation. But if that occurs, that what will happen is the kinds of things impacted are first of all the stock markets around the world. If there's a serious conflict. Uh, will be impacted negatively. And uh, it appears that it's moving in that direction. So that is a, is a, a risk that's on the fairly short-term, maybe intermediate-term horizon. Second thing, uh, grain and wheat, um, oil, gas. Um, uh, Ukraine is the third largest exporter of corn, corn in the world, for example. So a lot of products that come out of that area uh, could be shut off or impacted so we could have supply chain issues, food shortages, um, fuel prices going sky high, inflation, of course, going sky high. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of issues that are going on right now could be escalated. And uh, so th this is a political um, issue between two countries. Uh, <coughs> but I, so I don't know how to assess the probability of it, but I can tell you that it won't be benign as far as its impact on markets. Um, the um, China-Taiwan uh, issue was raised as a question, and I, it, my opinion is I think that's a, a risk area, but because the Olympics are going to China, um, and knowing how China uh, is positioning itself for the Olympics, it would be seem unlikely to me that anything would escalate prior to the Olympics. But beyond that, you could say that's also a risk item a little further out on the time horizon, and the, it depends on how that goes. But if that were to occur, similarly, there would be an impact on world markets. We are, uh, and I'll cover this a little more later, but our strategy is, our investing strategy continues to be updated and changed. We just changed it yesterday, for example, and continues to be uh, updated based on changing market conditions. Traditional models don't do that. They kind of put one model in place, and then you write it up and you write it down, and then you write it up again. So the, we think an adaptive approach has shown over time to be a superior approach, and that really paid uh, well for us last month because we were um, uh, 
uh, fractionally in the market, and we also had some exposure to um, assets that were rising during that market. So it made our loss for the month uh, modest, especially relative to others and relative to the S&P. But when something like this happens, uh, we are positioned to uh, change, to adapt accordingly. This was interesting because this happened, and, and it, it shows the chart that I referred to earlier with the uh, countries, the other countries, <laughs> almost anyone besides the U.S., money was going into those countries. And uh, this shows, this is the U.K., so you can see for about a month and a half that represented by the pink line, the money was flowing into foreign markets, foreign developed markets, and, uh, and the UK being an example of that. The blue line represents the S&P 500. So as money came out of the US market, the US market got hit, but other markets did not get hit or did get hit that much. This is just showing an example of the UK relative to the S&P 500. Now that's starting to change. You can see at the bottom, where it looks like now money is flowing back into the U.S. markets uh, and not as much into foreign markets. I took this picture. Uh, this was uh, last week, uh, toward the end of last week. Uh, at that point, Tesla was down about 29%. A lot of people follow Tesla. They're interested in that. It's a go-go stock. Uh, it's been up a lot, but it's a crazy ride up and down. And it has been down for... Uh, tw it was down 29% in January. I think we were down about four. <laughs> so 29%, I would not want to be invested in Tesla. Even though it had good returns the previous year, that's a wild ride. And then Bitcoin, uh, sometimes people follow Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is down 44% since November 7th. Another wild ride. People, when, when, when prices get very high, I get a phone call from people and they go, should, you think I should buy some Bitcoin? Well, I'll cover that in a minute. This shows, I want to show you a couple of charts on Bitcoin. This is a drawdown chart, or it's a stock chart actually, uh, showing how high Bitcoin go, goes up and then how far down it falls. And you can see these falls are very dramatic. People lose a lot of money. And when do they typically get invested in Bitcoin? Usually closer to the top because Bitcoin's going to 100, it's going to 250, et cetera. And then sure enough, it collapses. The other thing that's interesting about Bitcoin is that they were thinking and hoping, the promoters of Bitcoin were hoping that it would uh, be uh, some form of currency risk and be an antidote to stock risk. Not true. It is falling with the markets and greater than the markets. So you can see, you know, what happened to the stock market in uh, January. Uh, it was down probably about, S&P was down at one point, 10% uh, or more. And um, so look at Bitcoin, uh, dropped dramatically, uh, approximately half. And uh, so that's not a... Um, um, measure of protection against stock risk. This is a drawdown chart on Bitcoin, and you can see that Bitcoin has gone down uh, 40%, 50%, 60% from its high, uh, and it looks like no matter how high it goes, this kind of ride is in its future. Uh, not something that I'm personally interested in, but um, it's a wild ride. I've shown this before, and I'll, this is probably a good time to show it. Uh, and uh, that is Ben's rules for speculation. I have eight rules. And if you follow this and you're, you're determined, you want to speculate on some stocks, you know, maybe I should buy Tesla now, or maybe I should buy uh, Bitcoin at these prices. Okay, here are my rules. One, call it for what it is. It's speculation. It's not investing. Number two, limit your amount of in invested dollars to no more than 5% of your liquid assets. Number three, don't buy at the top. Number four, phase in dollar amounts in case you're wrong. In case it goes lower, you have some money to buy some more 
and then uh, five, don't look at it all the time. Six, hold it for at least three years. And if you must speculate, speculate on more than one uh, and be willing to lose most of your money. If you follow those rules, then uh, you probably you have a better chance of doing well in your speculated money than uh, by doing something different. Gold and silver update. So as of this morning, when I looked, gold price was 1802 per ounce, which is down about six tenths of 1% over about two weeks ago. Uh, silver uh, is up about 2% uh, at 22.71, and it, when I looked, it was actually climbing, so it could be higher than that now. And I give some resources for checking prices and spot prices. Uh, if you have questions or comments, leave them in the comments section below and I will respond to them. If you want to reach out to me and talk, I've uh, given my uh, phone number and my email address. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you next week where we will do a stock market only update. Thanks.